Hi besties, welcome back or welcome to the 20-something Teenage Girl Podcast, the podcast where we talk about spirituality, self-development, and being in your 20s. Also, sometimes we stray and we discuss my hyperfixations. So, Marin, what are you currently hyperfixating on? I'm so glad that you asked. It's Dune by Frank Herbert. My objective with this podcast episode today, don't leave. I don't want to lose you. Even if you're like, Marin, I will never read a book in my life. You sit and you stay and you listen. My objective with this is to convert you <laughs> to Dune. <laughs> To, to at least try to get you to attempt to read it. Because here's the thing. All my friends that say that they don't read, they're, they're liars. They're liars. And you're a liar if you say that you will never read. Because here's the thing. <laughs> Take a shot every time I say here's the thing. So all my friends always tell me, Marin, I just don't like to read books. And I don't believe them. Because every single person that has told me this, I have found a book for them. Okay? And they have loved reading after finding that book I just think it takes one book and here's the thing we're all different we're all different people we all have different likes interests so no fucking shit you're not going to like all the same books that I like or that your neighbor likes but there is a book there's a book out there for you and you never know it could be Dune because this is one of the best books I've ever read and I'm going to explain why I think so Okay. <laughs> I'm also going to talk about the movies, of course, because they're insane. So if anything, if any of that sounds interesting to you today, um, stick around. Grab a coffee. Obviously, I've drank too much. I will continue to drink more. And let's talk about Dune. Okay, here we go. So you guys, I did some research. Haha. <laughs> Uh, Dune was written over the course of six years by this man named Frank Herbert. It was first published on a magazine and it was there from 1963 to 1965 until it was finally published in book form in 1965. And I remember reading a story that at this point in time, after the Dune book was published in a sci-fi magazine, it was bouncing around from publisher to publisher. Nobody wanted to take it on. Everybody was intimidated by it. But one publishing company had an employee that was an avid Lord of the Rings fan. And he saw a lot of Lord of the Rings in Dune, which makes a lot of sense. The two series are compared a lot and pushed it to be published. Again, that's off my memory. My memory is like a goldfish and it doesn't hang on to anything. So somebody please tell me the real story in the comments. Uh, But moving on. So in the copy Dune that I got, there is a excerpt in it by his son, who I believe helped him finish the rest of the Dune series after Frank Herbert passed away. And his son describes the six years where he was writing his first book and the years following where he's writing the rest of the Dune series as feeling very removed from his father. He said that his dad didn't allow them to make any noise when he was in his study. And he was almost always in his study. His dad took his work very seriously and it makes a lot of sense because there is so much in here. Dune is not just a science fiction book. That is why I'm obsessed with it. There is philosophy in here. There is ecology, like what they call planetology, politics, science. I just, I could, everything, all the smart people things. Very smart man wrote this. Good job. Thank you. Speaking of Lord of the Rings, it's well-known knowledge that Lord of the Rings was based on Tolkien's experience in World War I. A lot of people assume that Dune is based on a lot of experiences that Frank Herbert had living through World War II. On my Googling, it says that he spent six months in the Navy Seabees, whatever that is, as a photographer before receiving a medical discharge. We can very much see the influence living through World War II had on Frank Herbert in Dune. There's the use of atomic weapons in the sequel, Dune Messiah. In the sequel, Dune Messiah, there is not only mention of atomics, but they even talk about Hitler. Another interesting thing to note is Tolkien's and Herbert's philosophies, wow, and worldviews are very different. You can tell that Tolkien is definitely more religious. I think he is Catholic. Let me just double check. Okay, it says here on Wikipedia. So it's right that Tolkien was a devout Catholic. And as far as I have been able to tell, Frank Herbert is not religious. Although he also was raised Catholic. 
but I don't think that there's any evidence that he was a devout Catholic as an adult. So I think it's safe to assume that he wasn't. Now, I mentioned this because the Lord of the Rings is a lot more upbeat. It's about heroes and happy endings and dragons. Whereas Dune is essentially a villain origin story. And one of its central themes is how power corrupts people. And one of the themes that I think he's trying to get at is how people aren't ever really good or bad. There's a big gray area there. Whereas when we read Lord of the Rings, it's very clear that there is a separation between good and evil. I want to talk about the movies. So I saw Dune part one for the first time, I think about a month ago. I had put off watching this movie for a really long time because a lot of the people in my life told me that it was too long, it was too hard to understand, and I listened to them for some reason and I never watched it. And then the other night, my sister and I were bored. We we're like, what do we do? Of course, let's watch Dune. We've never seen it before. Besties, you got you guys, if you haven't seen it, I would recommend that you just drop everything you're doing and go watch that because there's nothing that I'm going to say that's more important than watching it. But I had one of those moments where I was like, oh, this is one of the best movies I've ever seen. And it's been so long since I've connected with anything on screen or even been excited enough to go to the theater to see something. So of course, I immediately ran to the store and I picked up the Dune book, something else that I was warned against reading because it's too long and it's dull and it's blah, 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 blah. And I got through it so fast. Now here's where I'm going to give you my first tip. I actually think I would have had a really hard time with this book. I'm just gonna grab it. I like holding a prop. I think I would have had a really hard time getting through this if I hadn't seen the movie first. Because even after watching the movie, I still found myself having to Google a lot of terms. Frank Herbert is a genius and he really, really goes into great detail to build this world. And that is one of the most important things in fantasy is world building. It feels so tangible. When I'm reading it, I just, I feel like I'm there or I feel like I'm reading a book that is nonfiction. So another thing that I would highly recommend if you're going to try to read this is getting the audiobook. I always recommend this with fantasy because fantasy, in my opinion, is one of the hardest genres to read because a lot of the times you're reading about made up places and made up things. So it's easy to get lost or it's easy to get kind of exhausted or at least for me, just have the words kind of go in one ear and out the other. Having the audiobook in my ear holes really forces me to pay attention and it also helps me get through bigger books faster. So Dune isn't actually even as large as I thought it was. Maybe it looks really large because in the smaller more popular version it is thicker because the print is smaller but look at this like this is regular size print let me show you for the book girls that care about text size and I think it amounts to like what 600 500 pages it's really not as I'm saying it out loud, it sounds bad, but it's not that bad. The audiobook in itself is just also really good. They really went all in and there's like background music. There's different voices for some of the characters. In some scenes, there's just one voice actor, but regardless, it's a really fun listen. And I had a really good time reading it. And after watching the movie, I had a lot of my questions answered from reading this book. Then when I finished this book, I went back and watched part one and I still was learning so much. So there's a lot both in the movies and the books. There's also differences in both of them. And I want to talk more about the differences that were in part two, because while there are some differences in part one, they don't really make that big of a difference. What? How many times am I saying difference? In part one, they mostly just remove a few characters. For example, Gurney Halleck, who is the Mentat for the Atreides family, survives and is taken under custody by the Harkonnens, but he later dies from poison anyways, and he's not even really that important to begin with. So I don't really think that the movie suffers for this loss. Another difference that I think was a really good change was Dr. Liet Kynes in the book is a man, whereas in the movie they made her a woman. And I think that this was a really good change because I believe there's a clip 
of the director where he's talking about how Dune has this undertone of women being at the forefront of everything. Like the women in the the women in Dune really control everything and we get this right away with the character Lady Jessica. Even though the Duke Atreides is technically the Duke, obviously Lady Jessica and the Bene Gesserit sisterhood are controlling everything in the shadows. So it makes a lot of sense why they would want to add a little bit more girl power and make a girl one of the lead roles. Something else that I don't think is ever mentioned in the movies is that Dr. Klein's is Chani's father slash mother, depending on if we're talking about the book or the movie. The only other changes I think that I can think of in my brain, again, goldfish brain, we see a lot more of Hawat's journey as he is taken on by the smugglers. There's also a entire character that is a smuggler that is really important that I'm completely forgetting about. Something that they didn't include in the movie that I think would have really added a lot is this dinner scene. The night when the Atreides family gets attacked by the Harkonnens and the Sardaukar on Arrakis, there is this welcoming dinner that the Atreides family has with a smuggler, um, Dr. Liet Kynes, I believe Stilgar? I don't actually think, uh, I don't know. I don't think he was there. And the rest of the important royal people that, you know, have to do with Arrakis. And I just kind of wish that they included this scene in the movie because it was one of my favorite scenes in the book. Something that I think is so awesome in this book is Herbert's ability to make little conversations that, you know, by the ear wouldn't seem very important. Absolutely tantamount. Like this man is so detail oriented. We're getting inner dialogues from almost every single character and with characters like Jessica, Bene Gesserit, who have these powers and these abilities to pick up on this slightest muscle movements to read other people. It's so fascinating. We kind of get to see the world through her eyes and through Paul's eyes as well, who's very similar to his mother, and pick up on all these subtleties so that we kind of know what's going to happen before a lot of the other characters know what's going to happen, if that makes sense. I think that's it for the changes that were made in part one that I can think of. In part two, they made two major changes that I would like to discuss. The first change is with Aaliyah, his sister, who was played by Anya Taylor-Joy. So in the book, Paul and his mom are at the siege for two years before the book picks up again in part two. At this point in time, Paul and Chani have a son, Jessica has given birth to her daughter and she is two years old at this point. And then at the end of the book, two more years have passed and Aaliyah is four years old. So I understand why they didn't include this passing of time. The director said that he wanted this movie to feel like it picked up right after the first one, which I think was a really smart idea for just a movie. If you want to do Dune the book justice, you'd probably have to do a Game of Thrones type series where you can really include all of the details. But I think when you're working in a movie, obviously you need to cut a lot. So it makes sense, I guess. Good choice. But what I was upset about was I really wanted to see a small, like a toddler goddess. I do. So I feel robbed. <laughs> I watched an interview and the director said that they tried. They tried to bring in a little kid to do Aaliyah's lines and they tried to put a older woman's voice over her voice at first and then they tried a few test shoots where they just had the little girl reading the lines and it just seemed cheesy and I believe him I guess but I just I feel robbed. I feel absolutely robbed. And I will tell you why. There is a scene in the end of Dune, the book, where the Baron Harkonnen is in the Emperor's little fake city that he creates. And the Emperor brings out Aaliyah and she's like, hi, Grandpa, and kills him. Stabs him with the Gamjabar. Dead. And I, I just personally feel really robbed that I didn't get to watch that and I 
please tell me who I need to send a letter to. Thank you. So the second major change that they made in part two was with Chani's character. They essentially rewrote her character. In the book, Chani is very submissive. She kind of just follows along with everything that Paul says. There's no opposition to his claim to be a messiah. But I found it to be incredibly refreshing that not only did this movie include Chani being critical of Paul and Jessica, but for an entire group, in fact, it's noted that in the north, in Arrakis, they don't really believe that there's going to be a messiah, whereas in the south, there's fundamentalists and they believe in a messiah. As far as I can remember, that's not included in the book. And to me, this gives the story a lot more weight and it makes Chani feel more real. Unfortunately, Frank Herbert, as most men do, suffers from, I don't really know how to write woman syndrome. His Bene Gesserit women are obviously amazing, but like they're not humans. They're not human women. Chani, while an amazing fighter, doesn't have the intellectual powers that Bene Gesserit women have. So she, like, she's just a girl. And what would a girl do in that instance? I, you know, I would probably to be quite honest with you, submit to Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> but we don't like to think that if our boyfriend was like, hey, actually, like, I am the son of God, we'd, we would question him on that. At least I would hope that I would do that. And giving Chani this voice makes her the voice of reason, where we don't get a voice of reason in the Dune book. So it makes, like, it made me confused. I was like, is he a good guy? Am I supposed to be supporting him or not? And this was a common misconception. Frank Herbert was so pissed off when everybody thought that Paul Atreides was supposed to be a hero. So pissed off, in fact, that he said, I'm going to make it extremely clear that Paul Atreides is not a good guy in the sequel, which we, we can talk about the sequel for another day. Uh, we're, we, too many words for one video. But the one thing that I am so upset about is the very end scene in the movie where Paul <laughs> selects a bride and he's like, Princess Hirolan, we have to get married. And Chani is so upset. She goes off into the desert and rides her worm away seemingly like you know she, she's done they're breaking up they're done you know we're gone so I'm upset I'm really upset I'm really upset I'm upset because every fantasy reader in this world knows that in these types of universes marriages have nothing to do with love they are all political what the fuck do you think he's trying to do in the first place either he's going to die or he's going to become the emperor. How do you think he's going to become the emperor? Marriage. He has to marry Princess Irulan. Like, that or you all die. So I just... In the book, Paul has a conversation with Chani. And it's like, I will never touch Princess Irulan. I love you. You will have my children. I will never, ever have children with Princess Irlan. I will never share a bed with her. I just have to marry her because of political reasons. And even though she is upset, she understands. So I just think that that was mean for no reason. It doesn't make any sense. But, okay, wait. Now I'm starting to think that it does make sense because if we're making the character change that Chani doesn't believe that he's the Messiah, that she doesn't believe that he should become emperor, then it makes sense that she would just run away. She's just done with Paul and done with the whole religion. Okay. Yeah. Okay, girl. I did it. I guess go off. But then why would she fight with them? I think because she wanted her planet to be liberated. But why would you think it's good? You know, I just... I have a lot of questions for Zendaya's version of Chani. I'd like to talk. We need to talk. Another change that they made that I really, really liked in Dune Part 2 in the movie um, is they include a lot more scenes of the Princess Irulan. In the book, we only see Princess Irulan in the very end when she's with her father. But in the film, we get a behind-the-scenes look at Princess, Ir Princess Irulan's discussions with the Reverend Mother. And we see very clearly that the Bene Gesserit are behind everything. They're trying to control the throne. Florence Pugh did a wonderful job. Honorable mention, whatever his name is, Austin, whatever the heck. That man is sexy. But why does he talk that way? You, you can tell so much that he doesn't talk that way. 
and he's talking that way? Is it actually because he method acted too hard to the Elvis? Can someone tell these men they don't have to method act to be a good actor? I want to talk to who started method acting and maybe just tell him to not do that because it's okay. But anyways, he did a, oh my God, he did an amazing job. I didn't expect to feel sexually attracted to, you know, I just, I almost called him an egg. Looks like an egg, but I'm attracted to the egg and his body in it. Oh my God. Can we objectify a man? Can we, can we objectify him for a second? Don't you want to like lick it? I want to lick it like he licked that knife. Okay, holy shit. Am I on my ovulatory phase and do I need to shut up? So the the last notable change that I have to talk about is the emperor. You guys, you guys, why is Christopher Walken the emperor? (laughs) Did anyone else, did any, was anyone else like immediately ripped out of the story when Christopher Walken was on my screen I just I'm curious if the casting director genuinely was like yeah I want Christopher Walken to be my emperor like he's just he's my guy or if they were just like you guys Christopher Walken is the most famous person that we can find to play this part so he has to play this part because it just There's no, I think that it has to be the latter or nothing else because you guys, you guys, like, did you read the book? In the book, the emperor is kind of a dick. Obviously, he rules the universe. No one should rule the universe. And like, I just can't, Christopher Walken doesn't give asshole, doesn't give emperor, doesn't give tyrant. He gives supportive father that, you know, will help you achieve your singing and dancing career the other thing is like he's supposed to be a ginger i was told that the emperor would be a ginger where is my ginger emperor justice for my ginger emperor um that's all i have to say on that but for real the emperor is described as being really intense in the book to the point where when there were scenes of him i was far more intimidated by the emperor than i was the baron harkonnen whereas in the movie i'm much more scared of the harkonnens than the emperor you guys that's a problem that's not supposed to happen we're supposed to be scared of our villains this is me talking like i could make a better movie and i think that that's really funny that i have the confidence so i think that is it as far as changes go for dune part one and dune part two just another side note i think timothy chalamet absolutely slayed the house boots down acted so good so good acting good job i love you just everything about those movies is perfect the sound the costumes setting the uh, just every everything everything silly is boots house down and um is there even anything else that i could say it is so refreshing to have a chosen one story feel so realistic and so tangible because dune feels like our universe years in the future In fact, I think it is supposed to be our universe far away in the future because it's mentioned that Hitler is like in their past. And what Frank Herbert is doing here is he is pointing out the human condition, how history tends to repeat itself. In the book, after they go through an AI takeover, essentially their their machines get too smart and so there is a war against them and obviously the humans win but there is no technology in dune because of this they're not allowed to have computers so they rely on human computers called mentats and weapons which just goes to show you know this kind of cycle that humanity seems to be in where we're constantly taking two steps forward and one step back his commentary on religion here is also genius on how dangerous it is to combine religion and politics. Dune is not supposed to be a hero story. We are not supposed to look to one person to make all of our decisions for us. And I think the most interesting part about Dune 
is the implication that the religion that is in this world, Paul Atreides' religion, was planted thousands and thousands of years ago by the Bene Gesserit people that are more privileged and more powerful. And it is planted in these societies that are the most isolated that have the least amount of resources. So many things, so many things to think about. I could make a million videos just focusing on one theme that is in this book and talking about it for hours. (laughs) Yeah, besties, I think that that's it. Let's keep it short today. Um, I hope that I've convinced you to read Dune. It's absolutely insane, amazing. A lot of people said that they didn't like the sequel and I am enjoying it a lot. I'm almost finished with it, so I am confused. Um, I just keep learning over and over again to never listen to another person's opinion. So in that case, you don't have to listen to mine. You don't have to read it, but If you're like me and someone else has told you not to read it, but you kind of want to read it, like just give it a try. What are you, what are you losing? You know, YOLO. Swag. Okay. Uh, Thank you for tuning in. I hope that you're having a good day. If you're watching this on YouTube and can give me a a subscribe, (laughs) a like or a comment, that's all very helpful. If you're listening to this on Spotify and want to leave me a rating, that's also very helpful. You may also leave any questions or suggestions in the Q&A section. If you are looking to find me on social media, all those links will be provided down below. Some links to find this Dune book and the audiobook will also be down below. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about Dune. What did you love? What did you hate? Do you think the movies or the books are better? What did you think about the changes? What are some things that you think could have made the movie better? Or what are some things you think that they did that might have made it a little bit worse? What would you do if you directed Dune? That's a better question. I just threw so many questions at you. Answer them all. As always, I hope that you are taking care of yourself and you are drinking water, eating nutrients, and resting. If you haven't done any of those things, please go do them right now. If not, I will know. I will know. So you have to do it. I'm signing off and I love you and I hope that you have a good rest of your day. Okay, bye.